Ms. Ayan Ravinaka, bonjour and good morning. Welcome to our side event, Counting Women Using Disaggregated Data to Build a Resilient and Inclusive Blue Pacific. This side event has been organized by the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Women's International Network on Disaster Risk Reduction, the Pacific Community, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Australia. I am Litem Bukoto. I'm the disaster risk team leader uh, with the Geoscience, Energy and Maritime Division of the Pacific Community. I will be moderating this session. I would like to introduce you to Anais Rovero, our program advisor. Anais will be backing me up in the event of a glitch. Um, fingers crossed that we won't have that happening today. Now, thank you very much for those of you who have participated in the poll. Um, based on your feedback, we have a really good collection of um, participants joining us from Pacific Island countries, partner organization in, this, in the Pacific and beyond. Please feel free to scroll through the results um, whilst you're waiting. As you can see, 33% of people have indicated that they collect disaster de disaggregated data by sex. Now this means that we have an opportunity to work with the remaining 73% of you. Um, so it's not all bad news. I am pleased to say that we have a really interesting lineup for you today, and we expect to have ample time for questions with our panelists. So please feel free to use the chat box to type in your questions. Um, may I please also request that if you are not a panelist to please just switch off your, computer, your videos and, you, and mute your mics, please. This will just allow um, just for, uh, for us to be able to maximize the bandwidth that we're running on. I am pleased to say that this session will be translated. You know, thank you very much to our, our French and Sign Language Interpretation Team, Pinaka. So without further ado, we have an opening message from Miss Mami Mizutori, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and Head of UNDRR, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Mula Binaka, and greetings to all. Thank you for joining the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Pacific Community, and the Government of Australia for this side event at the 14th Triennial Conference of Pacific Women focusing on how data can be used to reduce disaster and climate risks faced by women. As recognized by the Innovative Pacific Resilience Partnership, the region is on the front line of climate and disaster risk, but is also a great model of regional solidarity and partnership towards disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Good data collection sits at the heart of our understanding of risk and it is vital in ensuring that gender equality is embedded in national and local strategies for disaster risk reduction. To achieve this, we need to improve the collection and use of disaggregated data based on sex, age and disability. This requires First and foremost, stronger partnerships across government, especially between national disaster management offices and national statistics offices and with NGOs and the civil society. Second, protocols and guidelines are needed on how disaggregated data is used and managed. Third, data collectors must be trained to accurately and ethically collect disaggregated data and everyone must have access to the data collected. Last and not least, diverse leadership and participation, particularly of women and people living with disabilities, helps to ensure that every person is counted in and that the rights of the most vulnerable are upheld. UNDRR supports women's leadership through our initiative WINDRR the Women's International Network for Disaster Risk Reduction, sponsored by the Australian government, which I encourage all of you to join. 
I am pleased to learn that six countries, including four small island developing states in the Pacific, are now reporting sex disaggregated data for disaster mortality and people affected in the Sendai Framework Monitor. UNDRR is ready to support our Pacific partners so that we can grow that number. Thank you for joining us today and I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Binaka Baka Levu. Binaka Baka Levu, Ms. Mizutori, um, you know, you stressing the need for access to gender disaggregated data, as well as encouraging the intentional participation of women and people living with disabilities to ensure that their rights and the rights of the most vulnerable are actually accounted for. And we, we, we have realized that you know, disasters dispropor disproportionately impact women and girls. We do need to improve the collection of and access to gender data for the purpose of policy development, you know, being able to guide investments and monitoring. And I think these targeted actions will actually help us minimize that impact on women and girls. The, the presentation beforehand is, is actually really encouraging, you know, that in the work that UNDRR and SPC have been doing with countries to gather and report on gender disaggregated data in the Sendai Framework Monitor, that we, out of the 14 countries, have six who have successfully reported disaggregated data by sex. I mean, that's got to be something that we should congratulate ourselves on. So throughout the leadership of people like our panelists, countries have been able to improve the collection and use of disaggregated disaster and climate data. And this is all towards building a resilient and inclusive Blue Pacific. I am pleased to introduce our first panelist, Ms. Susan Gray. Ms. Susan Gray is the Executive Director of FemLink Pacific, a feminist media organization which counters gender stereotypes through a range of media initiatives, in particular to promote the role of women in decision-making, focusing on local governance systems and development processes. So FemLink Pacific with feminist allies also uses disaggregated data to inform and influence policy, highlighting women's leadership and resilience and drawing attention to the impact of disasters on diverse rural women. Ms. Gray, could you please share with us FemLink Pacific's experiences on the best practice of data collection? Naka. Vinaka Litea, um, Bula Vinaka from the Fiji Islands and greetings to the delegates and attendees uh, from the Blue Pacific and also other regions of the world that have joined our side event on counting women using this aggregated data to build a resilient and inclusive Blue Pacific. Yesterday we saw the launch of the regional review of progress in 25 years of the report in implementing the Beijing platform for action in the Pacific. We took stock and we also saw the journeys of various women's organizations, such as Family Pacific, where, for instance, where it was seen that it's possible for women-led media initiatives to communicate and localize global commitments for a local audience. On a national level, and in my home country, Fiji, it was in about May 2019 that the Fijian government launched the Beijing Plus 25 Progress Report, with a national women's machinery led by our own Minister for Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation, Honorable Marisene Buniwanga, where two consultations were organized with representatives from government and civil society, including women's rights organizations. For us, that was also a counting women exercise with a heavy dose of passion and commitment in sharing with public servants or state actors in the same room where we share, shared learnings and our lessons, and we went also where we shared data. And after the consultations, we looked at drafts and hoped that to the end, our contributions would be taken with the same commitment that we all had when we, when we were all there together in the same room. Thus, with much excitement, we saw our inputs in about five areas from women in the media, women and the environment, violence against women, women and armed conflict, women in power and decision-making. By sharing our stories and our data with the national women's machinery, 
we also shone the spotlight on the political agency of rural women's leadership, including as first respondents or women's weather watchers during times of disaster through the establishment of what's called a Rural Women Leaders Community Media Network. Some 519 women, leaders of all diversities, including representatives of community-based organizations, disability rights, LGBTQI++, activist organizations and networks, as well as faith-based organizations and our women-led groups are part of that network. And on women in the media, they spoke about advocacy on using feminist community of media for rural women and girls. And in our engagement, we called for greater government and state support to community media with a less rigid regulatory environment. But how did we do this? How did we appear at the national? And how did we appear at the regional? And how did we do it and why? We were basically counting women at local level spaces. If there's something that resonates with us in the Blue Pacific, it's our Talanoa, our conversations as Pacific peoples and Pacific women. It is with that Talanoa that sometimes we are scolded for doing too much Talanoa. In an indigenous Itauke setting, women are sometimes told, Sarui Lebuna Talanoa, there's too much Talanoa, and perhaps there should be talk about something else that's more structured or more formal term is perhaps used to steer the conversations into a structure. However, in these times of social media with quick tweets and a constant rush of information, the Talanoa for Family Pacific is for us the heart of our documentation, our amplification around transformative work for gender equality, our counting of rural women and their human security challenge, challenges. One example I'd like to provide for is the Western Division consultation of rural women. This was just done about last month from all towns of the West except Singapore. These are the city of Lautoka, Nandi, which hosts the International Gateway and perhaps the Pacific's gateway to the world and vice versa, as what the state likes to call it. And there's Ba, Tavu and Rakiraki. The West is right now in Fiji, a focal point of the country's national containment, where with the capital and the surrounding towns, we are practically on a lockdown. And we're also in a lockdown here in the greater capital. In March, before the rollout of Fiji's vaccination campaign, of the AstraZeneca doses in the middle of the cycling season, our convening and Talanoa provided data that showed vaccine hesitancy among rural women. It also revealed the conversations and storytelling amongst themselves and in the marketplaces, where for instance, one quoted and said, write the correct explanation about the COVID-19 vaccine, put it in the media and the paper so that people can have the right message. Another said to her, to her, to her peers, all of us are afraid of what will happen if we get the injection because all of our bodies are different. We may get reactions, we are afraid. One expressed how this was a constant topic of discussion in the marketplace, as I said earlier. A confident one, basically, she just basically said, I'm very happy that people in the frontliners are getting vaccinated first because they put their lives in danger due to this deadly disease. So not accessing reliable health information by rural women about the vaccine impacts the decision-making and their dependence on other sources of information, including their spouses. Only 16% either agreed or strongly agreed that they were completely confident about the safety of the vaccine AstraZeneca. The remainder, 84%, fell into the categories of disagreeing, strongly disagreeing, or basically being undecided. This, as you all know, was data collected before Fiji's recent cases of local transmission, which has led to our national containment. As a result of this, we went into mainstream beyond our own feminist platforms, calling for more and clearer information, a consultative process in the rollout, and we appreciate the churches being called in. Slowly, we are able to engage with some of our health, par health partners and those involved in the program, at the same time, we are able to obtain on the ground feedback from our constituents and the rural women of a current vaccination drive that was just happening in Nandi yesterday using our Women's Weather Watch Network. 
as network members also try and help with the registration and try as much as possible to ensure that the priority groups in Nandi and Lautoka are able to access the vaccines and be in this batch for 12,000 people. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I think you've been able to access a wide network of um, of personnel that we probably wouldn't reach, we probably wouldn't interact with um, if we didn't actually collaborate with partners like yourselves. Thank you again. Talafalava Loa Fiona. I am pleased to introduce Ms. Ms. Taya Opo Fao Muina, the Assistant Chief Executive Officer of the Bureau of Statistics in Samoa. Ms. Fao Muina has 17 years of experience with the Samoa Bureau of Statistics, starting as a senior statistician in 2021, in, pardon me, in 2001. Um, Tai, as she is preferred to be called, has also been the, the assistant CEO um, of the division since 2018. And her experience in data collection for social statistics has also included gender and disaster statistics. Ms. Falmoina has participated in a variety of national and international training workshops and conferences. Um, Tayopo, um, if I may just ask you, when did the government of Samoa start to collect this aggregated disaster data and how did you use the gender data to inform and transform policy making? It's my pleasure to meet everyone virtually. Well, Samoa is a country at risk of disasters. Its geographic location and volcanic origins leads to both incredible natural beauty and a susceptibility to natural hazards, such as earthquake, tsunami, and cyclone. Human-induced hazards are also an invaluable threat for the small islands developing states. According to the Samoa Disaster Management Office, Data on Cyclone Bell and Ofra in 1990 to 1991, uh, 91, as well as the tsunami in 2009, were all collected on an aggregate form, or there was no breakdown to different level, level of disaggregation, as data was only captured the number of fatalities. In 2012, after Cyclone Evan, an initial Damage Assessment Form was put together by the response agencies under the Disaster Advisory Committee in which Samo Bureau of Statistics is a member. The Initial Damage Assessment or the IDA form is mainly for the initial damage assessment of the in infrastructure and it is targeting the household level. However, there are data on other information, namely the place of residence of the household, the household head sex, the household age, uh, household head age, the total persons in household by sex and age, as well as the total number of uh, persons with, the, with disabilities by sex and age. So after Cyclone Kita in 2018, SPS teams revised the form in terms of its format for ease of data collection. And we are also planning to use the computer assisted personal uh, interview method to collect data on any time of disaster, of, of disaster. Collecting data by different level of demographic information, namely sex, age, place of residence, education level, occupation, and other selected variables really assist in time of data analysis and report writing to inform policy makers and planners of the types of people affected by any disaster, whether they are male or female, young age, youth or the old age, and where they are living. Are they living at the rural areas or urban areas? And this will help for follow-up and assistance, and especially those who are in high need as soon as possible. 
So as a way forward, all response agencies should discuss again and revise initial damage assessment form. So that the target should not only on damage of infrastructure, but on people and their effects and areas that are highly needed after any disaster, and especially the vulnerable population like children, women, and people with disabilities. Thank you. Um, you know, thank you very much for sharing that. I think it's quite important that to see how the statistics, uh, the Bureau of Statistics in Samoa has actually started working closer together with your disaster management agencies responsible for the collection of, of disaster related data. Um, and also for emphasizing the importance of collecting social impact and not just physical impact. Um, I had a second question for you, which is, what would you and what would you suggest to enhance the co collaboration between ministries in the region um, to strengthen data collection as well as to influence policy in their respective countries? Naka. Thank you, Letia. Well, I am suggesting to set up a Pacific group on disaster statistics, in which all the disaster management offices and the national statistical offices as well as other members of the NGOs. Uh, it's, it is something similar to uh, what we call the Pacific Group on Disability Statistics. Uh, last year, we had uh, managed to uh, establish uh, this group for disability statistics. So something similar to that is uh, recommended. So in, in this group, we have to share experiences we had faced during disaster. We have to discuss what types of data that are collected by different uh, islands of the Pacific, how these data assist the planners and decision, makings, uh, decision makers, discuss data collection method to speed up the process and get the results as soon as possible. Uh, an example is, as I said before, the using of the computer assisted personal interview or the CAPI method. We also need to discuss other methods like uh, computer assisted telephone interview method, uh, something to replace the face to face mode in time of lockdown. Also, we need to discuss the assistance of technology in terms of the GIS apps for quick mapping and identification of areas affected by disaster. The last thing that we also need to discuss is a standard, standard tool or a standard questionnaire to make sure that data on different level of disaggregation for disaster statistics is created for the, for the Pacific community. Similar to, I, I believe that most of us are familiarized with uh, one of the Washington, uh, Washington group on disability statistics tool in which uh, all the disability statistics can be standardized when we are collecting them. So something similar to that uh, should be uh, discussed and created from that group to make sure that this data will capture the needs of individual people, especially the children, the women, and people with disabilities, which can assist the planners and policy makers of the right decision and the help that need to be actioned as soon as possible. Thank you, Litia. Um, I think you've you know, presented uh, you know, two reasonable recommendations that uh, actually do make sense. One is to start talking with each other and the other is, is around using technology um, in, the collection, in the collection of, dis of, of, of data of, or disaggregated data. I would just like to remind um, our fellow colleagues in the room, please, take this opportunity to submit questions through the chat box, or if you have anything in particular that you'd like clarification on, please use, your chat, use the chat box. Um, we've had two really um, good sessions with, with both uh, Susan Gray and uh, Taeopo, so please take this opportunity to, to, to actually ask questions. I mean, it's not often that we have such a, a strong group of women in the same room with us to, to, to tell and all with. So please do take this opportunity.
so we've we've the, this this whole notion of um, needing to get to the heart of, of, of what is the problem and uh, colleagues colleague, my colleagues at work drafted together this responding together a strategy for gender equality in disaster management in the Pacific. The strategy states quite clearly that women are underrepresented in disaster the disaster management sector, you know, particularly in the leadership and operational roles, you know, which are really career pathways um, for, to, towards leadership. Um, I am pleased to say that some countries are disrupting that status quo. So we have a short video from Ms. Ruth Timauko um, from the Solomon Islands uh, on how the country is actually addressing gender inequality of risk and promoting community resilience. I mean, this is through a program that is supported by the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UN Women, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and generously funded by Australia. Um, Ms. Tamoko is the Provincial Disaster Coordinator in Makira, that's in the Solomon Islands, and is an advocate for gender and protection in humanitarian actions. My name is Rudy Timauku. I work as a Provincial Disaster Coordinator for Makira Ula Province in the Solomon Islands. The GIR program is short for unraising gender inequality and disaster risk and promoting community resilience in Solomon Islands. It aims to promote the gender responsive, socially inclusive disaster risk reduction or DRR and resilience building in the Solomon Islands. This program is co-implemented by UN Women, UNDRR, IFRC, and Solomon Islands Red Cross. One of the good practices for the program was in 2019, by which gender and disaster profiles were developed in Solomon Islands through a series of consultation with DRR stakeholders and government sectors, both at the national and provincial level. Disaster resilience data and disaggregated data by sex were collected to develop national and provincial gender and risk profiles for Solomon Islands and Makira and Isabel provinces. These profiles are currently in draft. Once finalized, it will help us as a baseline for resilient development planning and influencing on inclusive disaster risk reduction policy in the country. Here are some recommendations to achieve resilience in the Pacific. Number one, government must take the lead in supporting inclusive disaster risk reduction programs to include budgets in disaster and risk reduction and sex disaggregated data collection in their development budget and plans by sectors. And three, have a central database for sex disaggregated data that is accessible to all DRR partners and stakeholders for preparedness, response, and recovery, climate change, adaptation, mitigation planning. In Nakavale of uh, Ruth, you know, for sharing this work that you've done in the Solomon Islands, but also demonstrating that change from, 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 the, from, from communities can drive um, processes in, in national government and being able to demonstrate that in the Solomons. Um, and also, you know, Nakavale for being an advocate for local preparedness and readiness. Um, and, you know, stating quite clearly that the integral role of government in this process. Um, you are a role model for women and girls.
Again, may I please ask that if you do have questions to please put that in the chat. Otherwise, I will be formulating those questions on your behalf. Last but not least, we have the pleasure of Her Excellency, Miss Julianne. Pardon me. We have the pleasure of Her Excellency, Miss Julianne Guevara, the Ambassador for Gender Equality for Australia. Ambassador Guevara was a senior career officer with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade before becoming Australia's first female Indigenous ambassador. I mean, that's a celebration right there. <laughs> ambassador Guevara's current appointment as ambassador for gender equality reflects her passion and commitment in promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. As many of you, um, appreciate Australia is an important donor for the Pacific, but also faces a range of hazards that have quite a high consequence as, you, as we would have seen with the wildfires. Um, if I may just ask um, Madam Ambassador, you know, how is disaggregated data used to inform Australia's investments in the Pacific? Napa. Latia, thank you very much and Bula Vinaka uh, to all our colleagues who are joining us today for this side event for the triennial. I'm absolutely uh, delighted uh, to be with you all. I'd like to begin obviously uh, first and foremost by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking from today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I think as the uh, special representative of the Secretary uh, General on Disaster Risk Reduction said, obviously the promise of the Sendai framework and of course our sustainable development goals was that we would have uh, no one left behind. Um, but this is a really central and important um, thing to consider in the context of disaster risk reduction efforts. We really need them to be more inclusive. Uh, it's been interesting, obviously, during this triennial to, to hear about the critically vital role that women have played during COVID-19. And I think, uh, you know, that, that, that very central role that women have in terms of helping with response to crises, um, knowing how to contribute effective, to effective uh, uh, recovery efforts is something that, that is really vitally important. Uh, as you know, Australia uh, has had gender equality and, and women's economic empowerment as a core uh, value and a core commitment um, through our development assistance program under our gender equality and women's empowerment strategy for a number of years. But I do think it's imp important to consider, I mean, even in the COVID-19 context, when we launched last year, of course, our Partnerships um, for Recovery, um, which really was our development and humanitarian response to COVID-19, uh, you know, we really wanted to prioritise the needs of, of women and girls. Um, why? I guess because we know that during crises, this exacerbates inequalities and has a disproportionate effect on women and, and their children. But we also know, as I mentioned, to have effective responses, um, we really do need uh, you know, these to be inclusive responses and to, to incorporate the views of, of, of women. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the broader question about you know, the, the importance of, of data, I mean, clearly quality data has the power to inform, to uh, transform our, our actions. I mean, we've been a long-term investor in improving uh, uh, gender data globally and regionally. Um, but I do think it's important, uh, I think you mentioned Latia, just if you think about um, you know, what's happening specifically in the DRR space, um, the importance of sex disaggregated uh, data, sex age and disability disaggregated data is, is something that you know, we're still in the process of, of developing. Um, I think there was a key finding obviously from, the, from UN Women's Report last year, which was called uh, Gender Responsive and Disability Inclusive Inclusion in, in Disaster Risk Reduction in the Asia Pacific. 
this was a study actually that was funded by Australia and Sweden, it, a, a key finding it had was that sex, age and disability disaggregated data is rarely collected, analysed or used to inform disaster risk reduction or resilience strategies. And I'm really glad that you um, have highlighted that, of course, uh, a number of countries in our region, in the Pacific region, are improving their um, capacity and capability of collecting this data. But clearly, we still have um, a, a little bit of a way to go. Um, yet, I guess, you know, keeping in mind and bearing in mind why we're doing this, we know that data about inequalities is, is going to be instrumental if we want disaster risk reduction efforts that give voice to women's agency, um, that give voice to people with disabilities and other marginalised peoples. So in terms of making sure that our responses are effective in what people need, we're going to need to have a good evidence base for it. Um, during the course of uh, this year, and in terms of you know, thinking about the support that Australia has provided, I mean, Australia is um, providing record levels of support to the Pacific, um, who of course, of course are our closest neighbours. Um, we've committed now, I think it's in the order of $500 million over five years from last year, so 2020, to build climate and disaster resilience in the Pacific. You hopefully some of you who were listening in earlier this week would have heard, of course, uh, our foreign minister and minister for women, uh, the Honourable Senator Maurice Payne. Of course, she has just launched our Pacific Women Lead, which is a new gender equality investment in the Pacific, um, which will see Australia invest around about $170 million uh, over the next five years for improving women's leadership, safety, uh, well-being, and economic um, security. And really it's designed, of course, to respond to the priorities of women in the region. You know, as we're all grappling, I suppose, at the moment with the, um, the impacts of, of COVID-19. Um, specifically on DRR, our partnership with the Pacific aims to equip women and girls with access to information and services and the tools and opportunities to do this because where of course women and girls can propose and design and lead uh, transformative solutions on disaster resilience and and of course then they can build a kind of more sustainable secure and, and thriving communities we're of course also very strongly committed to aiding um, you know, our neighbours in the Pacific in terms of, you know, your own commitments to uh, achieving um, the Sendai framework. I do have a couple of specific examples of things that um, we, we're also involved in. Um, obviously, through the Australian Humanitarian Partnership, we're supporting better post-disaster sex, age and disability disaggregated uh, data collection. This, of course, informs our humanitarian responses, um, for, example, in, for example, ensuring that women's needs are visible. At a very practical level, it's helping ensure that women um, affected by disaster have access to hygiene kits, um, that people with disabilities have access to shelters and access to assisted devices at those times. Um, another example is our partnership with Edge Effect. Um, Edge Effect, who are working with uh, stakeholders in Fiji to reduce the discrimination and harassment experienced by people um, with diverse sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and to increase, of course, climate change knowledge uh, in those communities and, and beyond. And that's part of, of course, our Pacific climate and disaster risk reduction actions. We also have programs like uh, Shifting the Power Coalition, which uh, provides support to diverse young women in Fiji to, to drive change from the bottom up in, in building uh, their individual and collective power and um, their real power to influence, I suppose, the decision making at all levels. So. Um, more broadly, I guess, you know, uh, Australia is really wanting to help shape those broader policy debates on gender data, uh, helping to shift the narrative around its importance, um, 
clearly, if you want to be able to be in a good position to influence um, transformative change, um, to transform uh, policy and regulatory settings, you have to have good data to support that. So, um, you know, really, we're looking to do practical actions which support um, uh, you know, countries in the Pacific on, on various um, elements of, of data collection and building capability. But we also want to be an advocate um, in, the, in the broader global context to kind of help support the reasons why gender data um, and sex disaggregated data is so um, vitally important in, in, term, in terms of issues like our responses to disaster risk reduction and recovery. I might leave it there. Thanks, Lathia. Um, the, the point that you'd made about quality data to inform and transform actions, I think is a really is, is really an important one. Um, and thank you for those very actually practical examples of why disaggregated data is so important. Um, we had a final question for you, um, if, if I may. What would you suggest to small island developing states in the Pacific um, to enhance the use of this aggregated data? Yes, yeah, thanks, Latia. I mean, I think, um, and a number of like speakers have have um, touched on this today as we've been speaking. I mean, number one, importantly, that it requires consolidating um, data on disaster risk reduction and on gender equality which are often collected through, um, uh, you know, separately or collected through different projects. You know, it's really important to have, um, you know, holistic uh, and systematic whole of government approaches. So I think, you know, our colleague who spoke from Samoa today um, from a national statistical office perspective about that linkage between you know, a national disaster management organization, that national statistics office, um, other ministries that respond, uh, including, you know, child development, having a holistic approach, um, having them coordinated uh, in, in the collection of data and sharing of, of data so that they can make informed decisions uh, that they can develop more effective responses. That would be my first um, point. So number one, good, holistic, systematic whole of government approaches. Um, the second is this question of, you know, real investment in data and risk analytics. And I, again, we've heard today of several ways of doing that and improving it through um, digitally enhanced ways of collecting that data. But I think, um, you know, hearing Susan Gray's responses today, you know, clearly there's a really important role in data collection um, that happens through our civil society organisations. So, um, you know, civil society have a real um, uh, sense of what's going on in the communities. They are community organisations, obviously. Um, and the delect, uh, and the data that they collect obviously helps us um, make much more um, inclusive uh, responses uh, in in the way that we respond in terms of policies and legislation. So that that critical um, need to obviously invest in data and risk analysis, um, but also to make sure that it's inclusive, of course, um, in having civil society uh, present in that. And my third point, I suppose, is um, this question around, um, you know, not just traditional recovery uh, measures in terms of, um, of data, but making sure, you know, that it is as inclusive as we can make, possibly make it. So having data on the needs of um, needs and priorities of women and men, boys and girls, as well as sexual orientation and gender identity groups. Um, is really quite important. Um, if we want uh, our responses to, to be really uh, targeted and effective, it must do that. And I just wanted to, yeah, maybe just give one example of that. I mean, we Australia supported the redevelopment um, of the Giza markets in the Solomon Islands. And this was um, uh, just after uh, uh, Cyclone Harold. Um, and, uh, it really was, you know, it was aimed to ensure, of course, that um, there were disaster risk resilient features um, 
in those markets um, uh, to kind of respond to the fact that, yes, we had seen the devastating impacts of previous cyclones. You know, it was really important to those local communities that they had a marketplace where they could continue to, to kind of, um, you know, to, to work shortly after, um, you know, ongoing natural disasters. Um, so the market um, now has sustainable water supply. Um, it has sanitation facilities. Um, it has disability access um, and it has clean energy supply systems. Uh, it was, as I said, as I mentioned, it was open soon after tropical um, cyclone Harold had passed. Um, and it's been really critically important um, in helping, you know, women in those communities um, to continue to, uh, you know, have a, a sustainable income. And I think, you know, if we if we get the right data, we make the right decisions about the types of projects that we want to invest in. And I think, yeah, I, I sort of shared that sort of market example because I think it is just one of those things where if you take into consideration the right data. Um, you know, you do get a better result. But yeah, as I said, it's really the, the three points were holistic systematic approaches to, to government, um, you know, considering how we incorporate data in our decision making, making sure we invest, uh, making sure it includes civil society organisations, making sure that it's inclusive in the data that we actually collect. Um, I think I might leave it there. Thanks, Latia. Thank you very much, Ambassador Guevara. And thank you very much for actually summing that up. Uh, I think you've done my work for me. Um, some of you know, three really good points that you've made. Um, I actually have some questions from people who are in the room with us. Um, so thank you for posting those. Um, if I may just ask um, Susan, so, what would you suggest to help Pacific Island governments uh, enhance the collection of uh, disaggregated data? I mean, we've heard uh, quite a bit of it, but, you know, really interested in, in your views on this. Uh, thank you, Tia. And uh, I'd just like to also uh, thank the panelists and the ambassador for um, for basically putting that on the table. Um, so really just about enhancement, I, you know, one of the side events yesterday basically also spoke about uh, that there's a lot of data out there, uh, you know, that's waiting to be further resourced for implementation and so on. Um, as, uh, you know, as basically a community-based feminist organization, I would really like to, uh, first of all, recommend uh, and again, this is the coordination also within the state machinery uh, uh, that all civic commit to ensuring that this aggregated data is publicly available for the people. Um, that you know, our countries in the Blue Pacific are basically facing multiple crises, severe cyclones, the climate crisis, now the pandemic. Uh, you know, we've had uh, food and economic health insecurities. Uh, that's basically emerged as the biggest worry for rural women in our uh, constituents and our localities. So it will really help our efforts that the data, for instance, that's collected by the Bureau of Statistics uh, and state agencies uh, of all countries, and in particular Fiji, is regularly published and made available. Uh, women's health data disaggregated by ethnicity is also important as we collectively work. There's also about having that, just that meaningful inclusion and use of our data, our stories with a lot of ethical care. Uh, women's organizations such as ours, we've been calling and putting levels of decision making. Um, our recent um, divisional consultations, they basically spoke, and these are rural women leaders basically from the West and then up in the Northern Division of Fiji. They basically called for temporary special measures at the local level. Let's take this beyond the national level. Um, you know, national level, there's a lot of conversations about that, but there's, if you're talking about impact, uh, in the communities and so on, uh, the, you know, the state with civil society and the state really needs to really come on board to just have that talent and have that convenings 
um, about planning and planning for better and impactful policies. Right now, um, we basically should be having our budget consultations, uh, but you know, we're in a national containment right now, uh, basically the whole of Fiji. Um, and um, we had started off our, um, our divisional consultations, just trying to focus on how we could basically go to the state and ask that, you know, that the national women's machinery, uh, women's health issues, education, and so on, that that's a resource and giving them that data, the stories that will basically show that to them. Uh, so that, um, so, so basically, Litia, I, I mean, I'd just like to emphasize that Fiji right now is facing one, one of the greatest battles of our life, you know, with the, with the announcement. <clears throat> And, confir and confirmation this week that we have the Indian variant of the, of the coronavirus. So it's really, really, really urgent that there's greater transparency you know, in, 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 the, in the sharing of data and, the, and, the, and, the, and having the strongest collaboration with women's organizations and civil society groups that we do come together, they know that they are, um, that the networks that are already there and the stories that are basically told in very safe spaces, that that's basically shared with the state and that's used in a very uh, meaningful and a, and a lot of, and there's a lot of ethical care in using that for policies that are meaningful and that will really have transformative change in the lives of women and girls. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, it's just really, really just so critical. Luckily, dear. Minakwalevo, Susan. I mean, I, I totally agree with you on the, you know, on, on, the, on the critical role, you know, that, that organizations like yourselves and civil society actually could lend to and actually make a change and make a difference, um, particularly in the crisis that we're facing right now. So we had a question for um, Tayaopo, if I may. Um, this was a question from the, the room. If you could please share um, some of the challenges that Samoa's faced in data collection. Um, and maybe a second part to that would be, you know, what is Samoa doing to include uh, gender, equality, gender equality and social inclusion indicators? as well as sexual orientation, gender identities and expressions and sex characteristics, um, Naka. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alitia. Uh, uh, you know, as I, as I said before that some, uh, some of your statistics is one of the uh, response agencies uh, under the Disaster Advisory Committee and our National uh, Emergency Office Center. So we are involved in there. But uh, in terms of uh, data collection, especially uh, the areas of uh, disaster statistics, I think uh, one of the challenges is because we don't have a, a standard uh, questionnaire on this area. And as I uh, noted before that we had started with uh, the initial damage assessment form. So that's one of the areas and as a way forward that we need to discuss with other response agencies to make sure that we have a questionnaire in which we can capture uh, other parts of the, of the, or the effects of the disaster, not only with the uh, infrastructure uh, damaging, but also with uh, the effects of the people, especially the population in terms of uh, their influence or their affection from disasters. So in terms of uh, in the inclusion of uh, gender equality and uh, sexual orientation uh, in data collection, uh, as I said before, we, we, we do uh, collect information uh, by sex only, but this is one of the areas that we, also, we still need more discussion on, uh, is the inclusion of other gender. Uh, for your information, we did uh, our questionnaire consultation for our upcoming census last week, and this is one of the, the areas uh, which was also uh, 
uh, requested by our Papa Fidi Association. And as I said, this is one of the, the areas that we need more discussion so that that part of the data collection uh, will be considered. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tai. I mean, that your, your points actually mirror um, an earlier, the earlier um, comment made by Ambassador Guevara on on, on, you know, on, on, the, on, on being inclusive, not in just in the, in, in the collection and the use of, of, of gender dis disaggregated data. Um, Ambassador Guevara, we, we have um, a, a, a question of sorts. Um, and it starts with, you know, that the, the priority should be given to, to remote and minority groups and that, you know, the technology is important and, you know, the use of it in informal networks is quite key. Um, you know, if women leaders were empowered to use this technology and the example I've been given is, you know, to fly a drone to be able to collect data, you know, both before and after disasters, um, being able to provide training in the, in the use of these technologies um, you know, is, is Australia also looking at some of these um, probably hands-on training opportunities? Um, thank yes, you. thanks, Latia, for the question. Um, and yes, yes, we are. Um, uh, as I said, I mean, we've been really conscious of the need to, um, during COVID-19 in particular, have a good sense of what is happening um, uh, in the region and we have been working with partners um, like, uh, for example, UN Women in trying to um, do some rapid assessment work in various, uh, collaborating with various countries in the Pacific to try and, um, you know, uh, collect uh, good quality sex, age, disability, disaggregated data. Um, as part of that particular uh, project, however, I think we were very conscious that, um, as you say, building that that localized capability is really quite quite critical for not just doing the rapid assessment work that we're currently undertaking, but also building that longer term capability in in monitoring future, uh, you know, disaster risk uh, episodes because. Although, yes, obviously everyone very much now is um, concerned about, uh, you know, the, the effects of COVID-19, um, you know, we are a region which is constantly affected by natural um, disaster issues as well, whether that be cyclones, um, even where I'm from uh, in far north Queensland in Australia, we, we have um, cyclones on a sort of semi-regular basis. Uh, as you mentioned, Latia, here in Australia, of course, we had um, the devastating bushfires. Uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that, you know, in the way that we respond, all of that is informed by the data. Um, so uh, in terms of the kind of work that we have been doing uh, more recently and in response to COVID, we are we are trying to look at building that localized capability for data collection because um, I think yeah that that is that is important for future future crises as well. Thanks. Nakavalevo and Ambassador Guevara for that. Um, we have one final video, and this is really in response um, over time to being able to provide a platform for sharing, and this is um, a network that was. Developed and set up by NDRR on the Women's International Network on Disaster Risk Reduction. Women's equal participation and leadership in public life is an important goal in itself, and it is essential for achieving sustainable development. Women's leadership in disaster risk reduction can advance gender equality while reducing disaster risk for everyone. The Women's International Network on Disaster Risk Reduction promotes and supports women's leadership in disaster risk reduction in four ways building the evidence base to demonstrate the difference that women's leadership makes to disaster risk reduction outcomes. 
strengthening leadership capacities by providing women working in DRR with professional development opportunities, including through mentorship and peer-to-peer -peer support programs, recognizing women's achievements through annual awards, and supporting women's participation in DRR conferences and events, supporting institutions to enhance women's leadership by supporting strategies and policies to reduce the barriers women face in advancing their careers. The network empowers women to attain leadership and enhance their roles in decision-making in disaster risk reduction. We invite you to join us. And you know, thank you for sharing Pacific women um, and what, what they've, they've contributed to this. Instructions for joining are in the chat box. Um, and you know, I would just like to thank again our panelists today. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experiences, um, some of your reflections and recommendations for us to be able to move forward on this. You know, I pray that we're not constantly having to have the same discussions at the next triennial that we'll actually be able to show how we've effected change in, in, the, in not just the collection, but also in the use um, of this aggregated data. So, thank you very much. Um, just to close, we have a couple of uh, quotations from um, women around the region that have been combined. And we will just share that with you as we close down. Vinakovalevo again to our panel. Ambassador Guevara, Vinakovalevo, Fafitailava, Tai, Susan, thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, uh, Miwa. Thank you. Naka. Thank you very much, Litea, and um, all the panelists. That was an excellent side event and very um, uh, insightful and rich discussions and lots of great comments coming also uh, from the floor. So that's, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. And I think it's a good uh, a segue into our um, plenary discussion this afternoon on uh, gender and climate justice uh, that starts at 12. Uh, so, um, everyone still on this uh, channel and in this um, 
uh, side event uh, group. Uh, that's the, this is the end of this uh, side event, um, counting women using disaggregated data to build a resilient and inclusive Blue Pacific. Uh, thank you so much for your participation uh, in this side event. And please join us at 12 o'clock for the final triennial conference plenary on uh, gender uh, and climate justice at 12 p.m. today. Vinaka. Vinaka Joanne.